Okay, good morning, everybody. Morning. morning. <laughs> I'm Chris Bateman. I'm the manager of the Plaques Program in Heritage Toronto, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all this morning uh, to today's plaque unveiling for Jack White. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land we're gathered on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Heritage Toronto also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, we're a charity and a city agency that brings people together to explore our shared pasts and, and people's lived experiences. Now in its 55th year, our Plaques program tells the stories of the people, places, and events that have shaped Toronto. Um, we're delighted that so many people could be here today uh, to acknowledge Jack White, including uh, many members of, um, of the White family, uh, reps from the Iron Workers and from, from QP. Um, you're going to hear a lot about Jack uh, in the next few minutes, but just a really quick rundown. Uh, Jack was the first black representative for the Iron Workers Local 721 and QP Ontario. He was also the first black union steward for the Canadian National Railway in 1944. In 1963, he was among the first black Canadians to run for provincial office with the NDP. Um, in the 1970s, Jack was the director of social services for the Ontario Federation of Labour, and he was pivotal in the Ontario Black Trade Unionist Organization. Until I was um, preparing these speaking notes, I, actually, I thought um, this plaque began with um, an article that Sheila wrote um, in Spacing Magazine. But it actually started much earlier than that, I realized. Um, I was going back through my emails, and I saw a message from Sheila uh, when we were unveiling a plaque for the Prince Edward Viaduct. She contacted uh, Councillor Fletcher, I think, at the time, um, and sent a note uh, highlighting uh, Jack's uh, story uh, in connection to the, to the construction of the, the viaduct or the subway deck in the 1960s. Um, and on that day, Councillor Fletcher uh, included Jack as part of her remarks, and I'm, I'm really, it feels like a nice piece of serendipity that we're here today to unveil a plaque, especially for Jack, that will bookend the Prince Edward Viaduct plaque. So on one end, on the east end of the bridge, you have the Prince Edward Viaduct plaque, and then we'll have uh, the plaque for Jack on the, on the west end uh, when it's installed later this year. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank the iron workers, uh, QP Ontario and QP National for funding this project. It wouldn't have happened without your financial support. Uh, the Iron Workers, in particular, have been long-time supporters of the Heritage Toronto Plaques Program. Um, their apprentices make the posts for our plaques um, as part of their training. Um, and so when this plaque is installed later this year, it will be on a plaque produced by the Iron Workers, which is another nice piece of uh, serendipity here. <laughs> Um, I'd also really like to thank Sheila and Al White um, for initiating this project and all your help and support throughout. Um, and it's actually now my pleasure to inter invite uh, Dhruv Jane from Councillor Jamal Meyer's office to present a scroll to Sheila. My name is Dhruv Jane and I'm, I'm here to present a, uh, um, a scroll to Sheila. Um, Council Jamal Myers would like to extend heartfelt con congratulations to Heritage Toronto and Sheila White on the unveiling of a new plaque honoring union activist Jack White. As a city proud of its multiculturalism, each and every community plays a role in enhancing Toronto's social and cultural landscape. Jack White was a prominent union activist who spearheaded in the 1960s the mobilization of a labor union to protect the rights of all black transit workers. I commend Heritage Toronto and Sheila White from the White family for their initiative in honoring a pioneer black union activist with a plaque near the Castle Frank subway station in Toronto. I extend warm congratulations and best wishes. Councillor Jamal Myers. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Drove. Um, our next speaker is uh, Steve Nevue from Iron Workers Local 721. Good morning. Thank you, Chris. Uh, my name is Steve Nevue. I'm with the Iron Workers Local 721. Uh, our president, Louis Barros, uh, sends his regrets and apologies. He's unable to attend today, uh, but he wants to, you know, 
send his very best to the, uh, the White family and uh, this honor of commemorating uh, Brother Jack White. Jack White is a pioneering figure in labor history uh, and holds the distinguished title of being the first black representative for the International Association of Bridge, Structural, Ornamental and Reinforcing Iron Workers at Local 721. Uh, his rise in the position was not merely a personal achievement, but a monumental stride for diversity and inclusion within the labor movement. Born in the early 20th century, White began his career uh, at a time when racial segregation and discrimination were pervasive. Despite formidable barriers, his exceptional skills and unwavering determination propelled him forward. White's appointment as a representative shattered a significant racial ceiling, providing a beacon of hope and inspiration for countless workers within the industry. His role extended beyond representation he became a, viral ad, a vital advocate for la fair labor practices, safety standards, and the rights of all workers, irrespective of race. White's legacy is multifaceted. Uh, he not only paved the way for future generations of black iron workers, but also helped to foster a more inclusive and equitable working environment. His courage and leadership exemplified the critical need for diversity within all unions, highlighting how representation can drive positive change. Today, Jack White is remembered not just for his personal achievements, but for enduring impact on the labor movement, championing a legacy of equality and justice that continues to resonate. Fraternally yours, Louis Barrows and the members of Local 721. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, I'd now like to invite um, Lisa Skeet on behalf of QP District Council to speak. Thank you. And of course, it'd be remiss if I didn't call up Sister Yolanda McLean, who is QP Ontario representative and the secretary treasurer of QP Ontario. I would just like to bring greetings on behalf of QP as um, John Jack White was very important. So we bring readings on behalf of QP District Council, QP Ontario, and what a wonderful occasion and a testament to John Jack White, to your family. And so I would like to introduce our president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists as well. It is such an honor to be here uh, this morning it's also such an honor to be put on the spot. Uh, but I do have to say uh, that's what Jack would have wanted because uh, he was an activist and so we all are. And that's what we do. And I want to thank the family for this honor this morning. Uh, Jack White, of course, was a CUPE member from my union. Uh, the first black representative uh, for the iron workers, of course for Local 721, which we heard, and the Canadian Union Public Employees, a union steward, of course, a construction worker, and an advocate, uh, an activist for not just uh, black racialized and indigenous members in our organization, but for everyone, because when one rises, we all do. And I wanted to say a piece of, uh, of information that I think resonates with me the most. Uh, when I read about him and when I've heard about his work and how valuable he was to our society, I thought of something that QP just did. Uh, a few years ago, we, uh, we have a plan called the Anti-Racism Organizational Action Plan, AROP for short, which is, uh, it names and addresses all forms of racism with specific attention placed on black, indigenous, and racialized members in our community. And it sh changes the culture and the shift of how we uh, are able to have leadership positions uh, in our unions and in our space. And it also increases the representation, not just in leadership, but also in our unions, but also like out in our communities. And when I thought of the work that he did, and I thought of like the, uh, the doors that he's opened as a mentor, I had to say that we appreciate this work because Cupid was able to not to just uh, say that we've done this work or we're able to have an equality lens in all the work we do. Because of his work, we truly understood what it meant. 
So I want to thank the family for uh, bringing him into our lives. And even though he's not here with us in person, absolutely here in spirit, because I believe that QP is doing the work that he started to do and we will continue to do in his honor. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and uh, Yolanda. Um, our next speaker is uh, Andrea Babington, President of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council. Oh. All right, so uh, I feel like it's, I'm on the highland, the light that's clearing out there. So, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I know, like, I'm, I'm so excited seeing everyone here, and I know if this was something that was opened up even more, we would have so many, uh, I would say, next generation in this room sharing their own experience of Jack. And I, you know, as I look at the history of Jack, I know Jack was on the move way before I was born. But, I, and, and he left us maybe in, in a time where I know I, I was on the scene. And so I, I, I am very proud because we look at all the accomplishment of, of Jack and um, think, wow, you know, this is great. But I also imagine for myself as an as a immigrant that came into this country and come out of a, a hospitality sector and seeing so many faces, so many faces from all over the world with uh, struggles. And I look around and wonder, how do we make changes? And, realize for myself as a young person coming in this country, uh, my first job at 18 years old, how do I run away when I, when I, I, I need the work and I, I, I am a breadwinner and then look around and realize for me to stay, stay and to put food on the table, I have to win over, I have to give voice to my coworkers. And so this is, when I read about, about Jack, this is what I, I also learned from Jack, that Jack wasn't a me person. I believe Jack also looked around and realized that if you lift in standard, it wasn't about him, but if you lift it for everybody else, then it, it makes us even stronger. I look at his experiences from all over um, as a steward and seeing myself in Jack's eye as a, a steward who I said, you got to be kidding me. Like, you know, <laughs> chances taken, I remember my own uh, 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 union uh, the president look at me when I said, I think they're going to fire me. Uh, taking on this fight in my workplace, and he said, let jo just let them try, we'll shut this place down. And I see that with Jack. I remember walking away and going, I think he's crazy, you know, I don't think, but I, I see that, and I realize that for a leader going out there and giving your all, the fact that he could have done that, and, and, and everybody know when you have a shop steward, you are the sacrifice. A shop steward is the one that needs to make it right and fix the wrong and, 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 and give us new things as well and take the blame. And, and to see Jack taking that chance and when he was fired, to see co-workers took that mantle up and decided that they have to fight for their leaders is so important and so rare for us having shop stewards that have the respect of workers. So I really lift him up and I feel uh, all the different areas, whether it's tending to injure workers, the passion around that, where so many of us take a plunge forward and step back. And I see myself as, uh, as someone who step in at the Toronto and York Region Labor Council. We represent over 220,000 working men and women and every day we don't know what's going to be the, the, the win, but, we, but I feel I, I, I go out knowing that reassurance that someone like Jack was around in a time where every leader out there have a bit of Jack. Um, whether they're in Toronto or York region and all over, I believe Jack is in our heart and Jack play that role and leave his footprint that we can step into that footprint in the sand. So I, I do thank the family for um, allowing us to share into this and, and to know very well that even when Jack is gone, this is some, Jack's name will not be forgotten because 
we are living, we're living what Jack wanted. Uh, you know, I, I, I see Jack somewhere standing and probably smiling and knowing that this job is not finished, never finished. But the fact that he was able to brave it, he was able to touch every heart out there, uh, a multitasker, I would say, a jack of all trade. <laughs> you know, very important for us. So, and I just, I just want to, you know, in Jack's voice, just to say a little bit, uh, you know, when I think of Jack out there and to remind ourselves uh, with the work that's out there and a, a quote by President Obama that says, change will not come if we want for some other, if we want for some other person or, or some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the change that we see. And I believe that was Jack, Jack thought when he, he stepped out and, and risked it knowing fully well that he's not sure what's coming back. But the fact that every single one of us in this room have a piece of it. Myself as a black person in 150 years as president of the Labor Co Toronto and York Region Labor Council is a testament. My sister Yolanda, who just came up here as the first black woman um, in uh, QP Ontario as secretary and treasurer, is also a testament. And I see Chris over there. And I don't want to rain the thunder, but so many firsts that we are also saying, and for myself, I am I'm a happy as first, but I also know that I have to hand that torch over. And I see that's what Jack did. He handed the torch over to not just a person of color, but all of us that benefit out of the gains and the win and the struggle that Jack did to get us this far. So, you know, again, thank you very much for allowing me to share my own as a sibling, I would call myself, <laughs> in, in Jack's journeys as well. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Our final speakers um, representing the White family are none other than Sheila and Alan White. Thank you. Please hold your applause. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. And as you can see from my very um, carefully prepared notes, <laughs> my, my role here is just to, to acknowledge uh, everybody who had a part to play in the plaque. And you've heard some of the story from Chris. But it, uh, the, the story really began with Jack. And then, I worked for the NDP for 12 years at Queen's Park, and I met Frank Saptel, who's now with the Machinist Union. And Frank was writing for an NDP magazine, and he came and asked me about my uncle Jack. And I referred him to Jack, and as a result, a wonderful article came out in the NDP newsletter. And that was very important, because we're at this point now where that information uh, helped me. Uh, to tell the story to, first of all, Councillor Paula Fletcher, as you heard, for the BIA's 100th anniversary of the Prince Edward Viaduct. And then, also at that ceremony was John Cartwright. John, just everyone knows who you are, but there he is, uh, former president of the Labour Council here in Toronto and York Region. And John, if you don't know John, most of you do, he's a, a, an amazing raconteur. He likes to tell stories. And this was a story he hadn't heard before. So he was quite um, eager to repeat this story, and one of the person he told the story to was John Lawrence of Spacing Toronto magazine. Uh, John himself, a very knowledgeable uh, writer of all things Toronto, took an interest in this and then approached me to write an article in their magazine. So I called Alan, because we'd heard this story since we were children, but we didn't know any details, and I said to Alan, what do you know? And I want to acknowledge, too, that all Jack's children are here, except for Jackie, who passed away, but I know she's here in spirit. Uh, the eldest, Lorna, who hates attention, she's back there. <laughs> and sitting beside her, her daughter, Amanda, my grandniece, and also Linda is here. And your family members are here as well, Linda. And so, uh, sorry, I didn't get to see who everybody's here, and now the bright TV light is in my eyes. So, uh, But acknowledging that the, the whole family is present for this. But Alan and I, and I pulled the family to find out details about Jack. I found out he had a mouth like a trucker. <laughs> <laughs> I found out he loved to bake chocolate cake. And uh, as you, most of you know who ever encountered Jack, he had the most gorgeous singing voice, which actually runs in our family. Uh, the White family are known for their singing prowess. In fact, tonight is the opening of the premiere of the All Black Opera, based on Portia White's life a Porsche cryptic. And 
And that will be doing just a few short blocks from here. And it is a series of firsts. As I said, COC, the Canadian Opera Company's first production with an all-black cast, the first black director, the first black librettist, costumer, wig designer. And I see now the hairs are starting to stand up on <laughs> because this is very, very exciting. Just as this plaque ceremony today is exciting to me because of of the words we've heard about lifting the new generation up, being a role model, creating a footprint in the sand for others, so that's great. And now just on with my story as to who to credit. So there was Paula Fletcher, the counselor, and John Cartwright, the great storyteller, John Lawrence, the uh, amazing editor. I mean, he made me, you'd, th you'd think I was a professional author or something. <laughs> <laughs> And so then we get to um, the article is published in Spacing, and I put a little line in there. You know, I was trying to play devil's advocate because I said, there's no plaque for Jack White honoring this event, the Wildcat Strike. And Chris Bateman reads Spacing Magazine, and that caught his eye, and I kind of hoped it would. <laughs> because then a phone call came from Chris Bateman at Heritage Toronto saying, hey, do you want to do a plaque? And I said, yeah, do we want to do a plaque? Sure we do. And he said, well, that's, just go out and raise the money and then come and talk to me. So it was two phone calls. Oh, no, it was letters, wasn't it? We sent it letters. Different. And then I dispatched Alan because, <laughs> you know, he's got the gift uh, of salesmanship. But it didn't really take that gift because that funding just flowed so easily. One email to both the unions, to uh, Louise and to uh, the QP rep. Yep. And within a week, I think. A couple of weeks. A yep. couple of weeks, we had our answer. It was so quick that Heritage Toronto hadn't even created a file number for the Jack White Black <laughs> project. So we had the checks before they could cash them. <laughs> And that was wonderful. Thank you to both those unions uh, for remembering. I also want to acknowledge that we have a guest here, Evelyn White, who gave me this button. Now, Evelyn is a writer of distinctions, worked for CBC, uh, author, uh, wrote the, auto, uh, the biography of Alice Walker. And uh, just put your hand up there. You might want to talk. You might want to talk to Evelyn later. She has a lot of stories. She gave me this button that says, every goodbye ain't gone. Yeah. And I think that's so telling today because it's very clear that Jack is not gone. And I th also think of the uh, accomplishments of labor leaders uh, in the black community. So we heard uh, Chris Campbell there, my newfound friend. I met him at Black History Month at Queen's Park president of the Carpenters Union, and then uh, the Amalgamated Transit Union has a black president, and the Labor Council has a black president, and I like the way this is going. I just think <laughs> it's really going in the right direction. I won't be too much longer. Um, it was David at QP that we wrote to, right, David? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that was both national and Ontario. And the, and the yes was so swift. I also wanted to acknowledge that my brother Chris is here with his wife Mary Chick in Ottawa. And now I think I'll pass things over to Alan. Um, I've exhausted myself, which is quite, <laughs> quite rare. Uh, I'm a talker. And if you're wondering why I did you know, use this book as a, a photo op and a prop, it's because I am an author now. This is a story of Jack's brother, my father, Bill White, and his lovely wife, Vivian, and their interracial marriage in 1946, 1947. In 1946, they came here to Toronto. They, they were welcomed with opening arms. Unfortunately, Vivian's family didn't feel it was appropriate for her to be marrying a man of color, as nobody really did in those days, and orchestrated a campaign of letters to write to my mother before she married my dad to try to persuade her not to do it, and she saved all the letters. And that's why the book is called The Letters. And I learned that when you're an author, you immediately become a mar marketer. So please ex excuse my shameless promotion. I'll be at Indigo in Mississauga on Saturday. <laughs> thank you, Sheila. And thank you all for coming. I am so honored to represent Jack's family. Um, I, I just... Um, I'm beyond thrilled to have everybody here. Um, I really wanted to thank the iron workers. You guys were absolutely amazing. If we can go back in time, if you think the mid-60s, 
Jack's the only black person on the job, and he gets fired. And the iron workers all pulled off the job for two and a half weeks. And let's all remember, they weren't getting paid if they weren't working. But they supported my dad, and they forced the employer to hire him back. And I don't know how, how many of you know the story, but he got, he got let go. He was a union steward. He got let go because they, the new foreman had brought some laborers in. Was, the laborers were trying to do the iron worker's job. Dad went to the employer and said, this has to stop. He was immediately fired. The employer turned around, called the iron workers, said, hey, we're one guy down. We need somebody else. The iron workers sent my dad back. He came back. He was immediately fired. The iron workers sent him back three times. They fired him all three times. And the third time they said, that's it. We're out of here. And they all walked off the job. I cannot thank you guys enough. That was, you were so forward thinking. Absolutely amazing. And Cupy, I, you know what? Dad, as you've all heard, you know, Dad loved to help people who were, who, who were, he felt were not being treated fairly. He did not care what color you were, what race you were, what gender you were. If you were in trouble, he was standing beside you. Cupy allowed my dad to find his sweet spot when he became the WSIB specialist for QP. He was in heaven. It was amazing. He got, every day he got to get up and help people. It was phenomenal. Um, so again, thank you all for coming. Um, with, Dad would have been very embarrassed uh, with all the, uh, all this. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but we're not. We're thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on. So thank you again. I look forward to talking to every one of you later on. And again, have a wonderful day. Thanks. I just wanted to, there was someone I forgot, and that's Meg Sutton, who's Chris's assistant in the Toronto Heritage Office. Thank you as well. Thank you so much, everybody. It's, it's now the moment you've been waiting for. We're going to unveil the plaque. So if everybody who uh, came up to the mic at some point today could, could gather by the plaque, we'll, we'll have a ceremonial un unveiling in a minute or two once we've got set up. So stay tuned.